Welcome to our unit on waves. So in this video I'm going to be giving you a brief introduction of waves. And as I go through this introduction I hope that you could fill out the blanks that are listed on the screen. So let's start off by pointing out that physicists used a few basic models to describe the physical world around them. One way to describe the world around them is to use uh, a point-like model where you describe objects by assuming that they're singular points that have mass and electric charge. We use this model when we were describing how and why objects move. Well another way of describing the physical world around us is to think of waves. For example, if you look at the ripples in a pond, such as this picture shown over here to the left, or say a slinky, like this picture over here, or even say musical sounds can be easily characterized by waves. A wave is essentially just a wiggle in time, or more specifically, it is some disturbance that travels away from its source. In this unit, we're going to be concentrating on mechanical waves such as water waves, sound waves, and say seismic waves caused by earthquakes. In these type of waves, the particles in the medium are disturbed. A medium is some material or substance like a solid, liquid, or gas. Mechanical waves are waves that require a medium. Now later on we're going to be studying another type of wave that does not require a medium. And this type of wave is called the electromagnetic wave, which is often shortened name is called the EM wave. Radio and light waves are examples of EM waves in which the disturbance consists of oscillating electromagnetic fields. And we'll talk about that just as we finish our electro electromagnetism unit. So let's say you st uh, take a stone and you drop it, in it into a nice calm pond. And as the stone hits the water, the kinetic energy of the stone is partly converted into energy of the waves as the waves move outwards. So a key point to realize with waves is that it's the energy that is transported or transferred from one location to another. See, if you have a mechanical wave, what we are carrying is the energy and not particles or the medium. If you uh, have ever gone, say, surfing on a wave or swimming in the ocean and you're riding that wave, hopefully you've noticed that the waves are transporting energy. Um, or you could kind of use the example of like, hey, surfing on the internet. Well, what's being transported? It's the information or the energy that is being transported uh, by various types of waves, such as light waves and the fiber optical lines. So a wave can transmit energy from one point to another, but it does not transport the matter between those two points. To help illustrate the fact that energy is transferred without moving matter between the two actual locations, let us investigate two further kinds of waves called transverse and longitudinal waves. All right, let's uh, click on the transverse wave. And there you go, there's a transverse wave. Now a transverse wave is a wave in which the motion of the particles in the medium is perpendicular to the direction of travel of the wave. You can see that these are the little particles in the wave and hopefully you can see that this wave is moving along here to the right. By the way, the top part of the wave, hopefully you know, is called the crest and the bottom part of the wave is called the trough. Now, to kind of illustrate the fact that these particles are indeed moving perpendicular to the direction of wave travel, I'm just going to click on a particle like here and look at this particle. The particle is moving up and down, yet the wave is moving to the right. 
So hence the particle motion is perpendicular to the motion of the wave. Now while we're at it, we can see some terms of amplitude, wavelength, and frequency being described here. What do you think would happen if I were to increase the amplitude of this wave? So I go from 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70, and 80. What did you notice changed? Let's pause it. Well, the amplitude is that maximum displacement that this particle here is going to take. So if I start right there at the top, and then I go right to the middle, that displacement is the amplitude. So it could be the distance from the crest to the equilibrium, or it could be from the equilibrium all the way down to the trough. Or you could measure the distance, for, say, from the tr crest all the way to the trough, and that would be two amplitudes. Now let's continue playing here, and let's say we were to cause the wavelength to get smaller and smaller and smaller and keep on decreasing the wavelength. What do you notice now has changed? Well, the wavelength is the distance between two consecutive repeating points. So if I look at the very top of this crest here, to the next time it repeats itself, which would be right here, that distance between this point and this point is known as the wavelength. You could also do it with the trough. You could take this point here and go this point here. Or you could take basically any repeating point. You could go from this point right here, highlight it, to this point right here, and that would be the wavelength. Okay. Now let's take a look at what happens when we increase the frequency. Now what do you notice? Well, do you notice that our little particle is now bouncing up and down more frequently? So the frequency is the number of cycles that this particle will make per unit time. Yeah, you could say oscillations per second or cycles per second. The units of frequency are measured in hertz. An example, by the way, of transverse wave is the electromagnetic wave. So light waves and radio waves are transverse waves. Okay, now let's go back to our main screen and take a look at longitudinal waves. Now, you may notice here what's happening. Hopefully you can see, if I pause this right here, you can see a bunch of the particles are being bunched up here. And there's also a bunch of particles being bunched up over here. So where the particles are bunched up here and here, we either call it a condensation, that's kind of rare that we call it condensation, we usually call it a compression, and then the places where the particles are really expanded from one another, we call it an expansion, that's not a normal term that we use actually, we actually usually call it the rarefaction. All right, so when the particles are all bunched up together, you can either call it a condensation or a compression. Where the particles are far apart from one another, we call that an expansion or a rarefaction. Now, the uh, wavelength, take a look at what happens if I were to make the wavelength larger. So as I increase the wavelength here and I pause it, the wavelength is the distance from this bunch of particles here to the next place where the bunch of particles here. You can see that the wavelength has gotten larger. If I were to uh, decrease the wavelength considerably, right here, hopefully you'll notice now that the distance between this compression and this compression is much smaller. Okay, And then if I, say, for example, change the frequency of these waves, you can see now this particle, if I click on one of the particles here, let's see if I can click on one of them, here we go, and you can see how this particle is actually moving, by the way, back and forth. And by the way, the wave is moving to the right. So I guess I should point out what the definition of a longitudinal wave is. A longitudinal wave is a wave in which the motion of the particles is parallel to the direction of wave travel. You know, we, we say that the particle is uh, moving along the direction of the wave travel, hence the word longitudinal. All right, an example of a longitudinal wave is a sound wave. Before I jump into more detail of sound waves, let me just consider this picture over here. Imagine I have a coiled spring that's attached to a wall and I were to simply pull back and forth on one end here and just do that once. 
that resulting wiggle of my hand would create a single wave pulse which would travel along the slinky down to the other end. Now if I were to move my hand back and forth in a regular periodic way I would create what was known as a periodic wave. So in this case we're moving our hand in a simple harmonic way. Harmonic waves are a special kind of periodic wave in which the wave or disturbance is of sinusoidal nature. It means it's either a sine curve or a cosine curve. Now in simple harmonic waves they all have a constant amplitude and a constant frequency and period. And there's a relationship between this wavelength, frequency, and period. And that's given by the following equation. The speed is equal to the frequency times the wavelength. Or the speed is also equal to the wavelength divided by the time period. You may notice that the speed is simply really this wavelength is distance divided by the period, which is time. So speed is really just distance divided by time. This equation is true for all types of periodic waves. No matter how the wave is produced, whether it's a you know, wave that is produced as an electromagnetic wave like a light wave or a uh, radio wave, or a sound wave that is produced by, say, some musical instrument or tuning fork. Okay, let's now study sound waves in a bit more detail. To understand the mechanics of longitudinal waves, such as sound waves, uh, in air, we will consider the following animation. So here we have a long tube of air um, with a plunger over here to the left in red that is moving back and forth. Now a loudspeaker is basically a sophisticated version of a plunger like this that's moving back and forth. Now, As the plunger moves forward here it compresses the particles that are nearby giving a higher pressure due to this higher density due to the displacement of these molecules. Um, since the plunger, plunger here is moving back and forth at a constant regular rate, we've got really a, a periodic wave. And so it's exhibiting, say, simple harmonic motion. So it's therefore producing alternating compressions and rarefractions. And you can see that the waves are propagating here to the right. Now the amplitude, by the way, is the maximum displacement of the particles. So if I were to look at one single particle as it moves back and forth, the amplitude is the maximum displacement that particle would go through. Your ears detect these sound waves. The loudness of the sound wave is related to the amplitude. And it's also related to frequency and a few other characteristics of the sound. But for all intents and purposes, you can think of loudness as related to the amplitude of the wave. If you were to strike, say, a tuning fork, such as shown in this picture over here, you would get regions of compressions and rarefractions, noted by the C and the R and the C and the R, as the wave propagates to the right. If you strike a tuning fork or move a plunger at constant frequency, you would hear a distinct tone. A tone is that note that has a single distinguishable frequency. Now the pitch of that musical tone is that quality that lets you classify these as either high or low frequency. The pitch is basically the, the perception of frequency by the human ear. The human ear responds to sound waves within a certain limited audible range. Humans with excellent human hearing we hear frequencies between 20 hertz all the way up to 20,000 hertz or 20 kilohertz. The term infrasonic refers to sound waves that are below 20 hertz 
and the term ultrasonic refers to sound waves that are above 20 kilohertz or 20,000 hertz. For example, um, the audible range of animals are not quite the same as humans. Like if you have a dog, uh, you may have heard that dogs can actually hear frequencies all the way up to 50,000 hertz. Hence, you can have dog whistles uh, that are made so that the dog will hear it come running towards you, yet humans will not hear it. Dolphins can hear all the way up to 250,000 hertz. And then on the other hand, elephants and rhinoceros, uh, they can hear uh, frequencies that are at the range of 10 and 14 hertz, below the human hearing range in that uh, infrasonic range. One of the ways that's not listed in the notes, but it's good to kind of give it a little bit of a mention, is earthquake waves. Now, earthquake waves require a medium. Hence, they are mechanical. But how would you classify them? Are they longitudinal? Are they transverse? Or are they both? Well, it turns out that earthquake waves have both components, both the longitudinal and transverse parts. You see, the longitudinal component of the earthquake wave travels faster, often giving advance warning of the arrival of the more destructive secondary wave. The first wave to arrive is often called the P wave or primary wave. And it's this long tunnel wave where the particles are moving back and forth and the waves moving to the right in this case. And the more destructive wave, which is the secondary wave, the particles move up and down and the wave moves to the right and left as, as shown up above as well. Now these two waves often arrive at different times. Sometimes the S wave will arrive maybe even up to 60 seconds later after the P wave. And um, by knowing the time period, by the way, of these two waves, you actually can determine, uh, and you'll see that later in our, one of our problems, uh, where the point of origin or the epicenter of the earthquake is. So earthquake waves have both longitudinal waves, which is known as the P wave, and transverse waves, which are known as the S wave. Now there is also one other type of sort of seismic wave, and that is the wave that is produced by the surface particles of a water wave. When you look at water, actually the particle rolls. It goes in this kind of circular fashion here. So water waves, or surface waves, have both transverse, up and down, and longitudinal components. So it's both partially transverse and partially longitudinal. In fact, move in a circular path. In all of these situations, remember, the medium as a whole does not move from one location to another. It's really just the energy that is being transferred from one place to another.